Whenever the family got together for reunions, the mothers would let the children convince them to stay a little later, just to give them more time with their cousins. There were always those who'd go off together and sit talking by the creek, others who would run and hide in the stables, others who would get into some mischief, letting a cart roll into the pond or jumping from the barn loft. Then they'd hear their mother's laughter, a loud, unbuckled sound because she was with her sisters. And the kids would realize that the adults were having just as hard a time leaving. Finally, it was time to go. You had to tell yourself that you'd be back again, that you'd see everyone again. Otherwise, you'd be too sad to even get in the wagon. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining this American Inspiration event presented by American Ancestors in partnership with GBH Forum Network. I'm Margaret Talkett, Director of Literary Programs, creator and producer of this author series. All of us behind the scenes are delighted you're with us tonight in the land of American history. This evening, we're going back through history to explore the life and family of Benjamin Banneker, the famous naturalist, astronomer, and writer from the time of the American Revolution. Our guest author will also bring you up to today into the world of his descendants, including her own. Before we start, some background on tonight's featured guests. Rachel Jamison Webster is a professor of creating writing at the in the English department at Northwestern University, where she has taught for 17 years. Professor Jameson is the author of four books of poetry. She has developed writing workshops with the National Urban League, Ancestral Medicine, Chicago Public Schools, and Gallery 37. She's received a Hewlett Fellowship for her implementation of diversity education. Her essays, poems, and stories have been published in many anthologies and outlets, including Poetry, the Southern Review, and the Yale Review. Now, about our moderator, Kendra T. Field is Associate Professor of History and Director of the Center for the Study of Race and Democracy at Tufts University. She is author of Growing Up with the Country, Family, Race, and Nation After the Civil War, which traces her ancestors' migratory lives after the Civil War. She's currently completing a new book, The Stories We Tell, A History of African-American Genealogy from the Middle Passage to the Present. I'm honored to say that she's also chief historian of the collaborative project 10 Million Names, which was initiated by my organization, American Ancestors, and seeks to document Black history one name at a time. Professor Field will join tonight's program in 25 to 30 minutes, uh, but for now, I want to welcome you, Professor Webster. It is so great to have you with us. I learned so much reading your book, and I really am looking forward to hearing more from you directly. Um, I spoke with a friend and a professional colleague this morning who said, I lived in Washington during the 1970s, and you couldn't be Black in D.C. without knowing about Benjamin Banneker. Great. <laughs> Isn't that great? He uh, he Good should to be on tonight. I I know many many others know a lot about Banneker's work, his genius. Um, but for those of us coming up to speed, we really thank you for introducing us to such an important man, um, a history maker, and his family including you, um, really, truly, thank you for the work you've done and for sharing his legacy. So um, so let's start right in. Um, over to you, Rachel. Again, thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Margaret. It's been such a pleasure to work with you so far, and I'm so excited to be here with all of you. It's really an honor for me to be part of the American Inspiration Series and American Ancestors. I feel that I've sort of found my people in this gathering of people who are interested in ancestry, interested in American history, and the ways that family ancestries intersect with our shared public ancestries. Um, so it's wonderful to 
uh, have this audience and this opportunity. And I have so much respect for Kendra Field's scholarship as a historian. And so I'm really excited to be in conversation with you, Kendra, as well. Um, so I am going to share my screen and um, go through a little bit of a description of the book and how I wrote it. And then I will read a short passage from the book. Here's the cover, Benjamin Banneker and Us, 11 Generations of an American Family. Um, as you'll see as I talk about the book, the book became an increasingly collaborative project where I was able to meet cousins and work with them to tell these stories. And so these are actually images. This is a rendering, a painting of Benjamin Banneker. And these are images from actual ancestors on the right side of the book. So this is Elsie Jones, who is the great grandfather of Gwen. Marable, who's in the book, my cousin. And then this is the mother of my cousin, Edie Lee Harris. Um, so it was important for us to honor the ancestors even on the cover of the book. The book centers on the history, as Margaret said, of Benjamin Banneker, who was born in 1731. So he was born to a couple who were free people of color. His mother had recently been um, freed from a 31-year indenture, and his father had recently purchased his freedom. Uh, the oral history says that he also tried to escape enslavement several times. By the time um, Benjamin was six years old, the family were landowners in Baltimore County, Maryland. So that's the context that Benjamin Banneker came up in. He were They were surrounded by Quakers. Um, there were many such families, free families of color in this area. And he had a few years of schooling at a Quaker school, but he was very intellectually hungry. And so he just continued to teach himself and to learn throughout his life. And toward the end of his life. He had some um, major accomplishments. Perhaps the most famous is that he published best-selling almanacs in Maryland, Delaware, um, Pennsylvania, and Virginia in this revolutionary era. So um, this was his, the second of his almanacs, or maybe it was the third, and it's the one that includes the rendering of his. So his almanacs were very important documents of the time. They gave the currency rates. They had maps in them. They, of course, had all the astronomy. Um, but they were also important documents for abolitionists and for free people of color because they were proof of African-American intelligence. So um, we know quite a bit about Benjamin Banneker in part because some people recorded his ancestry and his story uh, after his death. So Martha Ellicott Tyson was the daughter of his best friend, George Ellicott, and she took the time to interview family members and interview people who knew Benjamin Banneker and write his story in this biography. So because of that, we can go back really far in this family. We can go all the way back to his grandmother, um, Ma Mary Molly Walsh, her name gets a little slippery as these things do, who was an indentured servant from England who arrived in the com country around the 1680s, 1683. Um, and she actually partnered with a Wolof man from Senegal who was enslaved named Banaka around 1690. So they became the parents of Benjamin's mother, Mary. Um, and so we can go all the way back to the late 1600s, which those of you who do genealogy know that this is exciting, uh, but it's, it's quite rare in families of color or multiracial families in this country to be able to go back that far. Um, I learned about this ancestry in 2016. I had already been really interested in racial justice. I had already created a lot of writing programs through the Urban League. League. That had been my work for 20 years. So when I learned about this ancestry, I didn't even know that I had any African American ancestry in my father's line. But it wasn't, it didn't come as a shock to me. It wasn't a, oh, oh that kind of moment. It was more like a feeling of alignment. 
Um, and so I immediately became really interested in learning about these stories. And I just started to do a lot of research. I took my daughter and my, my niece Gwyneth on a trip down to Maryland to go to the archives, to go to the Historical Society and find everything we could about the Banneker family. And the remarkable thing, well, one of many remarkable things about this family is that the 100 acres of land that Benjamin's parents bought um, in 1736 is still preserved. And um, as any historian knows, and certainly as Professor Field chronicles so beautifully in her work, it's very rare for families of color to have been able to hold on to their land. There was so much racial violence that actually led people to have to flee from their land. What seems to have happened in the Banneker's case is that Benjamin left his land or some family members believe it was sort of taken from him and given to the Ellicott family, and they then made it a preserve. So it's very unusual. We can actually go back to the Banneker's land, walk the land, and this is a reproductive reproduction um, of his cabin. Um, so I found out this story, I became obsessively interested in it, and I researched a lot. But as someone who had not grown up um, knowing about my African American ancestry, at, here I was coming upon a really important story in Black history. So I didn't really know the ethics of me working with it. So I wrote a short essay called White Lies and Fiction, very short essay. And it just basically said that the passing in my family line was sort of mirrored in the nation's denial of African-American presence and genius in our origin stories. And I named the ancestors, not only the Bannockers, but later descendants who went up into Ohio and farmed their land and things like that. Well, because I had named the ancestors um, and, and kind of honored them in this essay, years later, my cousin Edie Lee Harris was doing a search for some of those names, and she searched for Aquilalette and saw my essay and found me on Facebook and said, we need to talk about our family. Um, and that was a great day in my life. Edie sort of welcomed me into the fold. She shared her research with me of 40 years, um, research about the Banneker family and other descendants. And then she introduced me to her brother, Edwin, who's in the picture on the left, Robert Lett, who's on the right, and Gwen Marable. And they all became collaborators on the book. So the way the book is structured is every other chapter, you have a chapter about the ancestors and I move through the generations and then a chapter set in the present that is a conversation between me and my cousins, uh, partly because I really wanted to trace the way race was being constructed in the early years of the country when these ancestors were making their way and trying to achieve freedom within these shifting laws. And I also wanted to trace the way we are still living with the um, the result of those laws and obviously with um, racism today. And I really wanted to learn from my cousin. So a lot of it is them telling me about their lives and sharing stories that were shared with them. Um, the other reason for doing the book this way for me was, of course, I wanted to talk and write about Benjamin Banneker. He was an extraordinary man, but I wanted to take his great man narrative out of that structure of individualism and um, recontextualize him in terms of his own family, including the women who gave him the space to be that genius. And so that's why I moved through the generations and I spend a lot of time with his grandmother, who again was that dairy maid, that indentured convict servant from England, and then with his mother. And while we were working on the book, new documents surfaced about the family, including this document document that is here. It's a court record of his mother arguing in the provincial court of Maryland for the freedom of her children. And in it, you see her calling these indenture laws 
repugnant. And these laws were set up for anyone who was multiracial. So the fact that she was the daughter of an African man meant that she was indentured for 31 years. The fact that she got pregnant while in indenture meant that her children would be indentured. So again, they were legally setting the stage for chattel slavery. Um, and we see Mary Banneke, as she's called then, or Banneke, um, we see her bravery, her um, intelligence, and it's the kind of thing we'll see later in her son. So it's important to me to also tell the stories of the women in this book. Um, Benjamin Banneker uh, did many things in his life. In 1790, he helped to survey Washington, D.C. So he actually did the mathematical equations and looked through the telescope to um, figure out where the buildings would go and help with that survey. So he was definitely recognized as an intellectual during his time. He was paid for his work on the survey. Um, and after that, he knew he was on the map <laughs> intellectually. He had met Jefferson. He had met uh, Washington. And he had already been keeping these journals of astronomical notes. He had already been keeping almanacs. Um, and so after he got home, he did, he from the survey, he compiled um, another almanac, and he sent it to Thomas Jefferson, along with an enclosure letter that really calls Jefferson out on his hypocrisy. It's an extraordinary document, and I'm going to read a, a little, the opening chapter, which talks about him writing the letter. Um, and I'm just about to do that before we switch over to um, the, the book itself, its working title for me was Reunion. And the book project itself has been an extraordinary process of reuning with ancestors through research, through oral history, but also having these reunions with living descendants who have generously shared their research with me and their um, lives and their stories. And so we continue to have reunions. This is my dad. A group of us got together at the Banneker land last year. That's my dad on the left and on the right. Um, that's a group of us at the Let Settlement in Ohio, which is where our ancestors left after they were sort of driven out of Maryland after the revolution. So this is from the very beginning of the book. It's called Letter to the Future. And at this point, Benjamin Banneker was 60 years old. He had completed his work on the survey, which involved staying up all night to make these astronomical equations. Um, it involved a lot of hard work. And he had come back uh, home to work on an almanac for the next year. Letter to the Future. Ellicott's Mills, Maryland, 1791. Benjamin Banneker tipped back his chair and rubbed his eyes. It had been a four-candle night. When his final candlestick guttered out, he set his quill in the ink pot. He stood up, but his feet had fallen asleep in the long hours of sitting, so he hobbled a bit on them, rocking from his toes to his heels. Benjamin stepped onto the porch and looked out over his land. The world was awakening, coming on in birdsong and rooster calls, in sunlight burning off the mist over the orchard. He had spent many nights lying in those fields, looking up through a telescope, jotting down notes. He had tracked the stars and planets as they passed the meridian, and had made the equations necessary to predict the precise times of an eclipse, as well as equinoxes and solstices, sunrises and sunsets. He had drawn out the phases of the moon and had projected all the major astronomical events for the coming year. His almanac for 1792 was finally complete. Benjamin took a quick walk around the orchard, clearing his mind. He twisted the stiffness out of his back and stretched his arms up toward the sun. He knew that being in relationship with the sun and the stars had always been a matter of survival. His people in Africa had followed the stars in their sky maps, and now he had the mathematical skills to track celestial events on paper in an almanac that would be of practical use. The almanac would help farmers plan the best time to plant their crops and fishermen to safely cast out into the tides. 
Benjamin checked his beehives and plucked some chives from the garden. Then he walked to the chicken coop and pulled two warm eggs from a nest. He stood at his kitchen hearth, stirring the eggs and chives into a skillet, preparing his breakfast while preparing his thoughts. He knew what he had to do next. Benjamin cleaned the nib of his quill and smoothed out a fresh piece of paper. As he addressed the letter to Thomas Jefferson, Secretary of State, he felt his hand tremble and clench a bit. His practiced, elegant penmanship was boring down on the page. He began cordially, acknowledging the fact that Jefferson had probably never received a letter from a black man. Sir, I am fully sensible of that greatness of that freedom which I take with you on the present occasion, a liberty which seemed to me scarcely allowable when I reflected on that distinguished and dignified station in which you stand, and the almost general prejudice and prepossession which is so prevalent in the world against those of my complexion. Benjamin reminded Jefferson that he was a free man, endowed with the same liberties as Jefferson himself. Then he contrasted his own situation with that of most African Americans who remained enslaved. By the third page of the letter, Benjamin was directly addressing the founder's hypocrisy. He reminded Jefferson of the revolution and began quoting his most famous written work, the Declaration of Independence, back to Jefferson, writing, this, sir, was a time in which you clearly saw into the injustice of a state of slavery, and that you publicly held forth this true and invaluable doctrine which is worthy to be recorded and remembered in all succeeding ages. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, and that they are endowed with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But, sir, how pitiable it is to reflect that although you were so fully convinced of the benevolence of the father of mankind and of his equal and impartial distribution of those rights and privileges which he had conferred upon them, that you should at the same time counteract his mercies in detaining by fraud and violence so numerous a part of my brethren under groaning captivity and cruel oppression that you should at the same time be found guilty of that most criminal act, which you profoundly detested in others with respect to yourselves. Benjamin Banneker sat back in his chair. He was surprised by his own clarity, by the way the words had flowed out on a rhythm of truth. He concluded the letter to Jefferson by admitting that he had not set out to write such a long message, but his sympathy and affection for his enslaved brethren had caused the letter's enlargement. Benjamin put the almanac and letter into an envelope, addressed it to Thomas Jefferson, and walked the three miles to the Ellicott and Company store so it could be posted. As he left the package and walked back over the stone bridge along the wooded paths beside the Patapsco River, he took long, deep breaths of the fresh air. He felt expansive, almost elated. He felt that one of the central purposes of his life had been completed. Thank you. So that's the opening to the book. And then again, it starts to move through time, through the generations. Um, and now I am really excited to be in conversation with Professor, Ken Professor Kendra Field. Thank you. Um, and I have your book here. I've learned oh. so much from your book and enjoyed it so much. Um, just thank you for your scholarship. Oh, thank you so much. It's a it's a real pleasure to be in conversation with you. Uh, well, this has just been um, a real gift, and I'm looking forward to um, the questions from our audience as well. So I wanted to encourage everyone to um, post your questions while I'm speaking so that we have uh, the chance to hear from all of you as well. Um, I will start us off with a few questions. Um, you know, you and I share um, this experience, really the privilege of researching and writing alongside our loved ones. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if you could share with the audience a bit more uh, about what that was like for you in the beginning, as things ramped up, um, once you got to the writing phase, um, how do you, uh, what was it like for you? And, and how do you think about and approach collaboration in the course of a project like this? 
I love that question. Thank you. It is a privilege. I feel so grateful to my cousins who invited me in and shared their research. So as I said, at first I was, I had an obsession with the stories. So I did feel a connection to the stories. I felt a connection to the ancestors and that uh, drive you have around research. But I really had a question of the ethics of it because I was, um, I because I didn't know this history going in. And I didn't think that that was some flippant question of who gets to tell one story. I thought, well, actually, the stories of ancestry are really important. And stories of um, white exploitation of Black stories and Black genius, it's a long history to grapple with. So I was sort of outside of it while doing my work. And then when Edie got in touch, it was like truly one of the great days of my life. And we're still really close. We call each other sister cousins because we're just sort of like we would be friends. And we started this conversation. It was like we knew each other. We were, you know, asking similar questions, thinking about similar things. But she had done, she's a, a really skilled genealogist, and she had started this work years before you could just go online and see things. Mm -hmm. So I, the book benefits from 40 years of research that she did mm -hmm. in microfiche, you know, really on the ground research. And then, you know, I would always thank her because I was very humbled and grateful for this. And she would say things, well, this is Grio work. And Peggy Sor Sawyer gave me all of her research in the 90s. So there, it becomes this litany of people to thank who kept the stories. Yeah. Um, and so I have so much respect for the way... Um, Families have done that, and particularly African-American families who didn't have the institutional protection of their stories and their genealogies. And so you have these family historians that are just extraordinary. And so another person, the other sort of central historian here is Robert Lett. And he and I had also a very deep intellectual, you know, affinity and connection. And he would often start sending me articles about the chapter I was working on. And he didn't even know I was working on that. So I had so many moments where it just felt a lot bigger than me. And and Edie, you know, Edie is a lawyer. She is a really rational person. And she'll say things like, "I," but I've had things that you wouldn't believe. You know, we all had moments where we just felt, and I know you have too, the ancestors are involved because how would this happen? So, for instance, those documents that surfaced while I was writing the book, and these are documents from 1731 that have always been there. But they had not been read in a certain way. They had not been found yet. So it was really exciting. There's also points of friction that I, I decided to leave in the book um, because I don't think you can do this work without those points of friction and also some pain with the way the story has been told. And then if the story starts to shift. Yeah. Yeah. So... I would love I to really, hear your take on that too. <laughs> no, I, I really appreciate that answer, and and then uh, just how how um, open to kind of vulnerability y you are through the writing. It's just really um, quite remarkable on a subject that can be handled any number of ways, and I really appreciate that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I also appreciate the nod to the long, you know, um, tradition of family historians doing this work. I had the benefit of great uncles and um, aunts and, and other folks who said, what, this is your job now? And just handed me some, <laughs> you know, papers um, from their trunk that they'd been collecting, you know, so that that um, it's such a rich tradition and and it's such an honor to, to, to be a part of it. Um, so, um, you know, I guess maybe I'll, I'll jump off of your, your answer to that last 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 part of the question. Um, you know, I often 
say that in the work of family history or genealogy, the two emotions that I encounter the most are pride and shame. Mm-hmm. You know, pride being the stories that um, people tell and retell with a with a very distinct purpose, and shame being the stories they don't want to tell or that they bury or or change in some ways, or they never become stories in the in the first place. Um, and I wonder if you if you might um, this might have to do with those moments of of discomfort or conflict, but if you might reflect a little bit upon um, or further upon um, the kind of emotional weight of of storytelling and and silences in this in this project. Definitely, I think that's so true, and I wanted to be sensitive to it. I mean, this this is a slightly aside to your question, but just the heaviness that comes. You know, that picture of Edie and I in the archives and we're smiling. I was so exhausted by the process because you have to read through um, land records about people. You have to read names of people listed in wills. You know, so there's a certain heaviness of especially doing this kind of history um, that I was really amazed by Edie's strength in navigating it. Uh, At one point, she just said, you know, if you want to avoid difficulty, you don't want to be do history and you really don't want to look at black history. (laughs) And, you know, you you can't. And she would all of the my cousins actually had this phrase. You have to take the good, the bad and the ugly. Um, and so I think that that that's true and and grappling with the ownership part of it, the piece that I get into very little, but maybe family members owning other family members. And that might have actually been to help protect a certain level of freedom in this marginal space, actually. Right. Mm-hmm. I think that's the way I would interpret it when I look at it with the oral histories alongside it. Mm-hmm. But it's still, there are still a gray area and it's still very uncomfortable. Right. And and then those documents that surfaced about Benjamin's mother changed the whole descendant community in a way. Because it means that her people that they thought were like cousins or more distant are actually half siblings of Benjamin Banneker. So there's also a, and I see this in your book too, right? There's a pride in lineage. And then there's sort of an insider outsider lineage that can happen too. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, uh, That's really, really well said. Um, You know, and there was a, There was a line you had, um, I think it was in chapter two, where you talk about a writer's relationship to unknowing. Mm -hmm. Um, And and I just heard it a a bit again in what what you were saying. And and I wonder if, I mean, I thought that that, that in that chapter in particular, early on in the book, you talk about your, you know, work as a, as a, as an educator, as a, as a creative writer, as a, as a, as a professor of creative writing, um, and about grappling in the classroom with what the past means to the present and what that means for for what we write or what we don't write. And I wonder if if you might reflect a little bit on 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 that process. Thank you. Yeah, I think I just wanted to keep the space in for that humility. And I always felt like when you're engaged in a deep creative process, Sometimes you intuit things, you don't know why you know what you know, Mm -hmm. or why you're drawn to what you're drawn to, which is also why I say I wasn't surprised by these stories. It was like it kind of explained why I had even been writing these little fictional vignettes that kind of could be ancestral stories. Mm -hmm. And that scene, I think, in that chapter with my student Cordero, he was... He was a student coming through a lot of difficulty in his own life, but he suddenly saw this picture of a Southern church and it was like he was transported and he did, he, he wanted to understand how he could feel like he knew a place. Mm. And so my practice with that has been writing and teaching writing and helping people to imagine into it, not using imagination in this like flippant way. But in some way where you're kind of trusting or trying to see where it leads. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, there were there were so many times in 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 your writing where you just beautifully shift from, I you know I'm painting a moment of what 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 may have happened, and you say, well, maybe it didn't happen that way at all, and you move on to another rendering, and and it, I think it's just um, um, so um, thoughtfully. Um, uh, it's such a thoughtful engagement between the archival record and and an oral history and and kind of historical imagination. Thank uh, you. Yeah. Um, shifting a little bit, and I'm encouraging everyone in the audience to, to post those questions now because we're getting close to that time. Um, I wanted to shift a little bit to how you approached, uh, you know, the history kind of on, on its own terms. Each historical moment um, you handled with care. So there was this line, um, maybe a quarter of the way in when you say, in Molly's time, European and African servants still ate and danced together. And you... Um, it reminded me of this this this, this quote by L.P. Hartley: "The past is a foreign country; they do things differently there." Mm. Um, and uh, as a creative writer who's working with archival sources, what was it like for you to immerse yourself in the kind of specificities of each of these twists and turns in American history? Um, you know, what lessons did you you know stayed with you most in the course of that work? I loved that part. So there was the sort of primary source work of the the documental documentable history of the family, the oral histories that I was inheriting from the family. But then I did all of this work in what I called contextual history, because I really wanted to understand the laws of the time. And so that's why I was so grateful to scholars like you, who were taking those documents and like interpreting trends or what was happening at the time. And I was kind of determined to write the book that I had never been shown or write the history. I had never been taught that there were so many free people of color, that freedom was this sort of porous, imperfect, changeable thing. And that in those very early days, you know, enslavement by race was not a given. It could have gone another way. Right. And I just felt like I never learned that in school. And I wanted to linger there on the um, and on the naming of whiteness, because I also kept I was aware of my whiteness. I didn't want to overdo that. But I also felt like this is a piece. I have a responsibility to look at that. Right. If that was the the camp my ancestors were getting into for safety, where did that begin? Yeah. Where did this divide begin? And so that's why I spent a lot of time with those laws then. Yeah. Yeah. And what a tragedy it is, right? That 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 so often um, young people aren't exposed to that and in incredible um, uh, literature. And, and specifically, uh, you know, I mean, historians use the term contingency to, to talk about really possibility, right? And this is what we all are interested in. What are the possibilities of each moment? You know, right. you have James Baldwin, and I, I used to, you know, when I was younger, carry around that quote on the bottom of, you know, anything, any email I wrote, um, it, it it was, um, you know, everything's happening, I'm going to not do it justice for the first time, you know, for the only time, right, that each moment is a new moment. And, and in fact, it doesn't mean that um, there aren't patterns, but but it does mean that that nothing is inevitable, right? And there's something liberating in that um, understanding of the past for, for what it means for our present. Exactly. Um, um, okay, well, I'll ask one more question, and then I will turn over to a couple of the audience questions. Um, this one has to do with uh, how you think about the passage of time. Um, there was a beautiful quote um, where you're talking about your own childhood, uh, and you say on page 10, I was a sentimental child, nostalgic for the moment I was in, even while I was living it, <laughs> as if I knew that my childhood already belonged to the past. Now this resonated, you know, very much for me, um, and I've, I've kind of frequently in my work as a historian and in someone that thinks a lot about storytelling uh, and genealogy, I frequently found kind of common cause or kinship with people who, as children, kind of lingered a little longer at the table or were raised in part by grandparents or who otherwise tried their best to kind of stop the hands of time. Um, and I found that many, uh, especially African American historians. And, and writers um, had something in their childhood like that, right? Where they kind of, um, uh, you know, they were the one kid that, you know, didn't go out to play, but stayed longer to listen. Um, and so I'm wondering if you might reflect for us on your experience 
of of this kind of way of being either as a child or as a parent or as a descendant and Mm -hmm. an inheritor of of these stories. I love knowing that there's a group of us like that. (laughs) Actually, it's like a kindred spiritedness. Yes, (laughs) I was definitely that person. I was always asking my grandparents to tell me stories. And my grandmother and I, they had like a small farm and grew our food. And my grandpa, after picking berries, we would be selling the berries in front of the house. And I would just sit there and ask her to tell me stories from their childhood and what they remembered. And we'd look at old photos. And I remember being pretty young, memorizing all my grandparents' siblings and trying. So some sense of like wanting to record it and wanting to know the family stories and who was related to who, whom. So I think I just always had an awareness of the past kind of shining through the present. Mm. And I grew up in a pretty undeveloped rural area. And I actually loved I loved looking at land and trying to see it as it was. So I would almost erase the, I also grew up next to a nuclear power plant and I would sort of erase that, you know, and I would try to picture what it had looked like. So it's almost like the past was this companion always, um, which I think is what makes the work so satisfying that we get to sort of go back and you can almost, um, imagine it physically because you've been kind of seeing the past and the present all along. Yeah. Really, um, really beautifully said. Um, We have a couple of questions that have come in from our audience. And um, the first one is an incredibly important one. How did you organize all of your research? Oh, I think I probably could have been more organized. When I look at all the files that are still on my desktop, um, (laughs) It's a little mind boggling, but um, I I did, again, I had sort of folders for things and I started to think generationally. And so I would have folders that would be, you know, stories that my relatives were sharing about this, documents that we found, articles, and then I'd have the contextual research and I took a lot of notes And I kept them actually in like physical manila folders and then looked at the quotes to see, you know, what kind of history I wanted to bring in. And then I had files of the transcripts. So I would, um, and that takes a long time. It's great that on Zoom, you can record a Zoom recording, but if anyone's then tried to edit it into a working transcript, it takes a while, but I would do that with my conversations um, with all of my cousins, because I felt that I wanted those to be kind of like dispatches from the present. A lot of times we're talking about the past, but maybe we're even talking about things now. And I wasn't sure at first what I would want to leave in or cut out. And so I kind of, you know, over collected as we do. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Um, a couple of questions came in about, uh, DNA. Is there a Banneker DNA project? And then a question about um, um, uh, how, and I think you covered this a bit, but how how you were found by your cousins and whether that DNA played a role in that. It did because it was the Ancestry thing. So my cousin was on Ancestry.com and um, I guess she had sent in her, um, you know, her feedback and gotten that. And then it was all documentable. I mean, you can see the census records. And this goes back through my grandfather, who I was talking about raising the strawberries. And he was a man who loved, who felt so grateful to own a couple acres of land in Ohio and grew food there. And it was just a really close, dear elder to me who helped raise me. So it went through his line so we could see everybody. But the first, I guess, initiating way that we were reconnected with the family was through Ancestry.com and the DNA test. And then when my father did it, you can see um, it's very interesting because the parts of the map that light up are Senegal and Guinea, which were the exact oral histories that Banaka came from Senegal 
and Robert, um, the father of Benjamin, came from Guinea. And so that was kind of amazing to see the map verify the oral histories. Um, yeah. Um, next question, how long was your journey? I, I think it means this research journey and how long before Benjamin Banneker became, you know, a central part of, of the story? Oh, good question. Yeah. So it was 2016 that I first, um, learned this, um, and started researching and the book came out in 2023. So, um, it's, it actually seems like that's not that long <laughs> to do in some ways because it was sort of all immersive. Um, I wrote the chapters about Benjamin last. I was actually most intimidated to write about him in a way. I wrote the chapters about the women first. Um, and because he had become famous and there was more written about him, that was felt like a slightly different project to write about a famous ancestor. And so, interestingly, I got to him after I got to all the other relatives. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Um, I want to cap capture as many of these questions as we can. Um Can we talk a little bit about the question that you raise yourself in the book about who gets to tell the story or whom's story? And yeah, then I mean, that was definitely in my field of creative writing. That has been one of the most salient questions of this particular moment. Um, and I was asking it with my students. We were grappling with this um, in classes I taught. And so I knew to grapple with this question and to take it seriously. And I decided to use my own connection as a way to ideally open up that question in more interesting ways. Mm -hmm. So it's not, it's not just like a turf war. Mm -hmm. It's that it comes from a lineage of, again, white use of black intellectual property, property, bodies, stories, all of those things. It comes from that. And so there has to be an awareness of, um, of that. And I grew in my own awareness a lot. You know, I wasn't perfect with this. I, I had a certain like belief in the process that originally, you know, but I, but I ended up keep evolving and I think it made the book better. It made me more humble, more able to learn because I knew that those questions would be asked of me. And I had a lot of, you know, my first agent dr dropped me. I had a lot of people say, like, you can't, you cannot write this book. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of like, well, but they're really my ancestors. Is there a way to write it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's always in the writing, too. I mean, I think I remember when I, you know, I was working uh, on my uh, dissertation. And so it was not so much about this as much as it was about kind of the myth of objectivity and the historical discipline. And when I came in with stories about my own family members, I said, is, is, is this allowed, you know? And, <laughs> and I had someone said, well, it'll, we'll find out in the writing. So give it a try and we'll see, right? So how to write, um, you know, what the rules are about writing, I think is very much, um, and subject matter depends so much on on the power that we have in, in, in how we tell a story as opposed to what the story is about. I love that answer. I feel like I want that's a really helpful answer because it's sort of I think there's a Toni Morrison quote similar, like you're allowed to do this, but not poorly. And if you do, <laughs> you people will let you know, right? Right. I they mean, will, <laughs> They'll let you know right away. Mm -hmm. And it, and I guess I just felt too, like, is there a way to let, to use these tensions, even these rejections as a way to keep learning? Yeah, absolutely. Um, which, which is the, the goal. I think you talk about the goal of transformation versus shutting down. Mm -hmm. Um so uh, two, maybe I have a couple more questions here. Uh, one is what was taught in your, schools and your American schools in relationship to slavery. Um, and uh, the person says, I noticed that what you learned, I noticed what you learned in school and the disconnect 
between that and what your research shows. Mm-hmm. Um, so what was that like for you, your own education and schooling in relationship to your subject matter? Yeah, I think I had a good education in terms of the founding fathers. I had a good, um, I had a really good history teacher in public schools in small town Ohio who had us all uh, take on the persona of someone at the Continental Congress and research their arguments. Um, And so I always felt like that really helped me to understand the kinds of arguments that laid the foundation for the government. But it was spoken of in the abstract. You know, it was like a concept or an idea. I didn't have a history that helped me um, really connect with African-American people as people. I would say that I got that later through literature because that was always the literature I wanted to read and teach. And so that kind of human education was self-directed in a way. Mm -hmm. But I don't, you know, I, and this was, this was the eighties and the nineties. And so we actually had multiculturalism once I got to college. So we're reading different voices. That's what it was called then. That was great. But, um, you know, we didn't learn that like the entire economic system rested on enslavement and it didn't have to, again, like the contingencies or the potential for other ways of thinking were never there. Hopefully it's better in some places. My daughter's in high school now and she's getting a lot of African-American history, which is great, but obviously we know that it's threatened elsewhere too. Um, A few questions have come up related to passing. Um, People sharing that they've had photos in their family in which some were clearly of color, but now later came came to pass as white. Um, and so these questions are your thoughts on uh, the history of passing in the context of family history and genealogy. Yeah, that was um, that was a big discovery. We always had like a strand of darker skin in our family. And you can even see in the pictures of my dad and my daughter. And if you saw me as younger and we always said that we were we always learned we were part Native American. And we might be in some part, but I think that was one form that passing could take is going into this like romanticized story of being um, part Native American. We actually can see how it happened in our family. It wasn't one person leaving the family and um, going as an individual. It was a whole family group that left and the people that they left had been incredible activists in Southern Ohio. They had um, a a thousand acres of land. These allied families had gotten these plots. They had fought the county for the right to an education. They had their own school, they had their own church, and they were continually harassed. Um, And I, you know, the racial violence and and the swindling that happened to get people of color off of their land is staggering. And there there's a sequel to this that could be written about those generations. But um, after that, our our ancestor, Peter, moved up north to Pennsylvania. He worked at John Brown's tannery, John Brown, the abolitionist. And Um, A lot of these free families of color were sort of united with that movement. And then all his children left at one time. And they came to Northeastern Ohio where my family still lives. You know, my grandparents, my dad had 30 first cousins. I mean, that's really the family place. And um, they all started passing on paper in those years and it's sort of slippery where first censuses they're all listed with an m for mulatto even though no one else's race in the ta- in the whole neighborhood is listed they're mm-hmm. called out as different mm-hmm. and then by the end of of Susan's life my great 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 grandmother her she's listed as white um, there were photos. She had darker skin. So, some family members had photos. So, um, I mean, 
Kendra, you you have done more research about this and you know more of this complexity of why and how people um, passed or changed there because the racial, it was getting so calcified mm-hmm. that um, one more thing to say, I had a lot of shame in the beginning of this project around passing mm-hmm. and the more I learned, first of all, I had some very kind colleagues and cousins, African American people who sort of said, we understand it was a totally different life if you could do it. Mm -hmm. But then also when you see what was happening on paper, they couldn't be legally married. They couldn't own anything. (laughs) Um, And so there's a there's a little bit of like legal finagling that happens so that there can be some safety. They also tried to burn down the schoolhouse or they burnt down the schoolhouse where the children were three times. So there was a real flight from racialized violence going on too. Mm -hmm. Um, Thank you so much for for sharing that. Um, I think I'm probably up to my last question or two. Um, And we have a great deal of praise coming in for for this beautiful book. And one question says, how do you manage to balance between contextual history and family history in a manner that is not too encyclopedic and also doesn't leave anything out and that is still highly readable narrative? I just did my best. I don't know. (laughs) And, you know, some people like the fact that there's imaginative passages. Some people didn't. Some, you know, it was sort of, this weave that I felt like I wanted to try to get in as full a truth as I could. Um, and so I wanted to, to try to do those things together. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, Margaret is, is is that my last question there? (laughs) Oh, I can't hear you. What could be better than what she just said? So um, I, I think that's a wonderful way to close. And you've done an, a remarkable balancing act, Rachel, with this content. Um, and I really want to thank both of you for this insightful conversation. Um, not You certainly took it off of the male-centered story to really grappling about the past and the present interpretation and also action. Um, I love that your family's a uh, family of action um, and both of you women are up to such great things. So as we do for all our authors in the American Inspiration Author Series, we've asked um, Rachel to share a reading from her book. So um, back to you for that. Thank you. Thank you both. Kendra, it's an honor to meet you and be in conversation with you. Thank you for the questions and this opportunity. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. Um, Yeah, thanks. So this is um, toward the the end of the book, not the very end. It was said that Benjamin was buried beneath his favorite tree on his property, but a stone does not exist and we do not know where that was exactly. This makes me think of the tomb of the unknown soldier in which one soldier's remains stand for all the soldiers who were lost. We could consider Benjamin Banneker a similar model for black genius. We have the story of this brilliant black thinker and naturalist astronomer and writer from the revolutionary era. But his story can stand as a monument to all of the brilliant African Americans whose stories, inventions, observations, and even names are lost to us. Benjamin Banneker was the most documented and acclaimed Black scientist of his time, but he was certainly not the only Black thinker, observer, and inventor of the revolutionary era. Benjamin's legacy is also one of liberation, a reminder of the creative possibility in each brief lifetime, of the sustenance of learning and wonder, and of the decision to use one's freedom to promote freedom for others. His legacy lives whenever someone sees past the limitations society would put on them in favor of invention, discovery, spirituality, and study. His legacy lives whenever anyone fights for justice or writes what they did not know they could write because love of their brethren has enlarged their mission. I like to imagine that Benjamin and all of these ancestors are watching from the cosmos and embedded in the land, present in the interconnectedness of things, in the plants and moon cycles and sunrises, maybe even in the sudden presence of a red cardinal out my window as I write this. 
Whenever the family got together for reunions, the mothers would let the children convince them to stay a little later, just to give them more time with their cousins. There were always those who'd go off together and sit talking by the creek, others who would run and hide in the stables, others who would get into some mischief, letting a cart roll into the pond or jumping from the barn loft. Then they'd hear their mother's laughter, a loud, unbuckled sound because she was with her sisters. And the kids would realize that the adults were having just as hard a time leaving. Finally, it was time to go. You had to tell yourself that you'd be back again, that you'd see everyone again. Otherwise, you'd be too sad to even get in the wagon. Thank you. Rachel, that is lovely. Um, how lucky your students are to have you as a creative writing teacher out there at Northwestern. And how lucky we all are. You're an absolutely beautiful writer. And, and I do really like the enlarged mission that you see for Banneker and also for all of us, um, the importance of his lifetime and also his unmarked grave standing for all less recognized Black men and women, really for all people who accomplished great things and got little respect. There are so many of those folks out there across all categories of people. Um, there is a connection here, as you say, through time to all who did and succeed who and who are still succeeding and surprising us outside the bounds of what, what's expected. So I, I love that, that reading of yours um, and that Banneker's legacy of creativity, learning, wonder, and action, it lives on and it lives on certainly in your book and in all the great actions um, of, of so many folks folks today in this world towards social justice. Thank you both for a truly delightful discussion. Um, and to the audience out there in Zoom, the end, we thank you. We appreciate your interest in America's history, all the places, the people, the good and the bad stories of where we've come from here in this country. We really hope to see you again. And for now, a very good night to all. Thank you both to our presenters. Thank you both presenters. Have a good night. Thank you.